this video, we're going to cover the properties of atoms and the periodic table of the elements. In the previous lecture, we covered cell fundamentals and types, and the difference between unicellular and multicellular organisms. Organisms are composed of matter, which is anything that takes up space and mass. So matter can be metals, gases, oils, or what we covered in the previous lecture, living organisms. Matter is made up of elements. An element is a substance that can't be broken down to other substances by chemical reactions. Examples include carbon, oxygen, and copper. There are 92 naturally occurring elements, and each of these elements have symbols. It's usually the first letter or two of its name, derived from Latin or German. An example here is helium, with the element symbol HE. Okay, another important term to know that we're going to cover is a compound, which is a substance consisting of two or more different elements combined in a fixed ratio. One example of a compound, which I know you know, is table salt, sodium chloride. This compound is made of the elements sodium and chlorine in a one-to-one -one ratio. By themselves, sodium is a metal and pure chlorine is a poisonous gas, but if we combine the two together, we get table salt. I mentioned previously that there are 92 natural elements. Now, about 20 to 25% are essential elements that an organism needs to live. There are four elements that make up around 96% of living matter. We have oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. And the remaining 4% are calcium, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, sodium, chlorine, and magnesium. There's also what's known as trace elements, which an organism needs, but only in small quantities. Examples include zinc, copper, iron, and manganese. Okay, so now let's subtract complexity and break down the smallest unit of matter, and that is an atom. Each element consists of a certain type of atom. Atoms are symbolized with the same abbreviation used for the element that is made up of atoms. For example, let's take hydrogen. Hydrogen's symbol is a H, and so it stands for both the element hydrogen and a single hydrogen atom. Alright, so an atom is the smallest unit of matter. However, atoms are composed of even smaller parts, known as subatomic particles. So think of Russian dolls or nesting dolls, a smaller doll placed inside another, okay? The chemical properties of an atom or of atoms include three subatomic particles. We have protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons are positively charged electrons are negatively charged, and neutrons, they don't have a charge. Let's draw this out. The atom contains a dense central nucleus, also called atomic nucleus. The nucleus is made up of the positively charged particles, protons, and the electrically neutral particles, neutrons. And so the protons give the nucleus a positive charge. And the negatively charged electrons move around the nucleus at some distance from it. Now, all atoms of a particular element have the same number of protons in their nuclei. So it's quite unique to that element. And so the number of protons of a particular element is called the atomic number. And we can write this as a subscript to the left of the symbol for that element. For example, let's take the element sodium this abbreviation tells us that sodium has 11 protons in its nucleus, and unless it's indicated, an atom is neutral in electrical charge, which means there's also the same number of electrons as there are protons. So the atomic number tells us the number of protons and electrons in an electrically neutral atom. Now, we can combine the protons and neutrons to determine the mass number. So the mass number is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus of an atom. Similar to the atomic number, we can write the mass number as a superscript to the left of an element symbol. Using sodium as the example here again, we can write it as this. 
The 23 at the top here is the mass number, total number of protons and neutrons. The 11 is the number of protons and also the number of electrons in a neutral atom. Now we can also determine the number of neutrons by subtracting the atomic number from the mass number. So for sodium, for sodium, 23 minus 11 gives us 12 neutrons. Like I mentioned before, all atoms of an element have the same number of protons, but some atoms have more neutrons than the atom of the same element. And these are called isotopes of the element. So isotopes are atoms of the same element that have different numbers of neutrons. Let's go through an example. Carbon has three isotopes. 99% of carbon atoms have six neutrons and six protons, giving a mass of 12. But approximately 1% of carbon have seven neutrons and six protons. And the third isotope has eight neutrons with a mass number of 14. So as you can see, all these carbon atoms have six protons because if they didn't have six protons, then they wouldn't be carbon. So the atomic number, the number of protons is unique to that element. And that is how we can determine what kind of element it is based on the number of protons. Going back to carbon 12 and carbon 13 here, these are stable isotopes, which means that their nuclei doesn't have the tendency to lose subatomic particles. This process is called decay, but with carbon-14, it's unstable or radioactive. Carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope. What that means is its nuclei decay spontaneously, giving off energy and particles. And so when decay occurs and it changes the number of protons of an atom, it will become another atom of a different element. So taking carbon-14 here, when a carbon-14 atom decays, a neutron decays into a proton. And so that carbon-14, it's going to become a nitrogen atom because we're changing the number of protons. Okay? So... We've talked about protons and neutrons. Let's now move on to the third type of subatomic particle and let's break down electrons. Electrons move around the nucleus and when two atoms come together during a chemical reaction, their nuclei don't come close enough to interact. And so only electrons are directly involved in chemical reactions. Electrons vary in the amount of energy they have. So energy is the capacity to cause change, the ability to rearrange matter. And energy exists in various forms. There's kinetic energy, which is the energy associated with movement, and there's potential energy or stored energy. Focusing on potential energy here, stored energy, matter tends to move towards the lowest state of potential energy. Electrons have potential energy because of their distance from the nucleus. The farther it is from the nucleus, the greater its potential energy. The potential energy of an electron is determined by its energy level, which is the average distance between an electron and the nucleus. Okay, let's break this down. Electrons are found in different electron shells. Now, the 3D space where an electron is found most of the time is called an orbital. So electron shells or an orbital is used to describe the region of space where an electron is present most of the time around the nucleus. Electron shells are also called energy levels because electrons contain energy. Let's draw this out here, okay? We can represent shells as concentric circles. The first circle, or shell, is closest to the nucleus, and the electrons in the shell have the lowest potential energy. Let's bring on another circle. Electrons in the second shell have more energy. And if we bring in another circle, electrons in the third shell possesses even more energy. So electrons in shells close to the nucleus have less energy than electrons in shells farther away. The way I like to think about it is, imagine a staircase and the floor, okay? The floor is the nucleus. The farther you are away from the floor, the greater your potential energy. So if you are on the first step of that staircase, you have lower energy in comparison to if you are on the top of the staircase. So the farther away you are from the nucleus or from the floor, the greater your potential energy, okay? Now, an electron can move from one shell to another, from one step 
to another step. And as it moves, it either absorbs energy or loses energy. The amount of energy gained or lost is equal to the difference in potential energy between its position in the old shell and that on the new shell. When an electron absorbs energy, it moves to a shell farther out from the nucleus. And when an electron loses energy, it falls back to a shell closer to the nucleus. So thinking of staircases again, as you're going up the stairs, you are gaining energy, okay? You're absorbing energy. And as you go down the staircase and closer to the floor, you're going to be losing energy. Now, what happens to the energy it loses? That lost energy is usually released to the environment, okay? So we've covered a lot so far. And before we move on to constructing the periodic table of the elements, let's quickly summarize what we've covered so far and bring in all the concepts and all of the subatomic particles together. So subatomic particles include protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons are positively charged, neutrons are electrically neutral, and these two particles are found in the nucleus of an atom. The third particle, electrons, are negatively charged, and they are found in regions of space around the nucleus called orbitals or electron shells or energy levels. They are called energy levels because electrons contain energy. Now, electrons in shells close to the nucleus have less energy than electrons in shells farther away from the nucleus. So thinking of the staircase again, if you are close to the floor, the nucleus, you have less energy in comparison to if you are at the top of the staircase. Okay, if an electron moves up your shell, it absorbs energy. So if you were to climb a step, Okay, if you were to go to a step higher than you are originally, you're going to absorb energy. And if it moves down a shell, it's going to lose energy. So if you go back down the stairs, you're going to lose energy. When two atoms come together, their nuclei don't come close enough. And so the electrons are the particles that are directly involved in chemical reactions. And so the behavior of an atom is determined by the distribution of electrons in the atom's electron shells or orbitals. Now, the chemical properties of elements are arranged in a tabular form known as the periodic table. Shout out to the Russian chemist Dmitry Mendeleev for the development of the periodic table because now we have a way to organize all the chemical elements in terms of their properties, their chemical properties, such as their atomic weight, atomic mass, and their symbols. So let's break down the periodic table. The elements are indicated by their chemical symbols and are listed in order of increasing atomic numbers from left to right. Each row is called a period and elements in the same period have the same total number of electron shells and the elements are ordered by increasing atomic number and each vertical column is called a group. Okay, let's simplify this table and let's just take a look at the first 18 elements of the periodic table. And let's show the electron shells as concentric circles here so you can see the distribution of electrons among its electron shells. Usually, each element would be presented like this here with the element symbol in the middle, atomic number at the top, which is the number of protons, and the atomic mass at the bottom, so number of protons plus number of neutrons. And the circles here represent the electron shells, with the dots, okay, these cute things, being electrons, and of course the nucleus in the middle. Remember though that each concentric circle represents the average distance between an electron in the shell and the nucleus. So looking at the simplified table here, each row is called a period and elements have the same total number of electron shells. So for hydrogen and helium, they have one shell. Their electrons are in the first shell. So the first shell can only hold two electrons, which is why in the first row, it's only hydrogen and helium because hydrogen has one electron in its first shell and helium has two. And so atoms with more than two electrons, they're present in higher shells. So the elements of the next row has a second shell. The second shell holds a maximum of eight electrons, okay? And if you move down a row, these elements have a third shell. All right, now let's take a look at columns. Each column is called a group, 
or family. And elements of a group have they all have the same number of electrons in their outermost shell. So for example, let's take carbon and silicon here. They both have four electrons in their outermost shell, and so they have similar chemical properties. Another example is beryllium and magnesium. They have two electrons in their outermost shell. And there's a name, okay? There's a name for this for electrons occupying the outermost shell. The outer electrons, okay, are called valence electrons. And the outermost electron shell is called valence shell. For example, let's take boron. Boron has three valence electrons, and the second shell is the valence shell. Now, atoms that have a completed valence shell are unreactive. They are chemically unreactive, which means they will not interact readily with other atoms. And the reason why, because they're complete. Their valence shell is full. They are happy. They don't need to interact with other atoms to complete them. Okay? And that is electron distribution and atom structure. In this lecture, we learn that matter is made up of elements and how an atom is the smallest unit of matter, composed of subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. We broke down what atomic number and atomic mass means, what isotopes are, and the energy levels of electrons. We also covered how all the chemical elements are arranged in a table in terms of their chemical properties. So now that you know the structure of an atom, in the next lecture, we're going to cover how atoms combine to form molecules and ionic compounds. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe to EKG Science so you don't miss a single lecture. And remember, subtract complexity and slow down. To study the next lecture, simply click the next video or you can view the entire playlist. Hey, stop procrastinating.